is the greatest name. And we're looking at Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. <laughs> Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. May the Lord richly bless this reading of his word. Amen. Be with us, Lord, in a special way. What's in the name? Excuse me. What's in the name? From a biblical perspective, Everything. From a biblical perspective, it's the essence of a person's character. What's in the name? How about this recently? A six year old girl who is called Jane Shawnell, or Jamie for short. Her name has more than 1,000 letters in it, including the titles of movies, cars, countries, and cities. It's an amalgamation of a hundred shorter first names. It has 1,023 letters and two apostrophes. Her middle name has only 36 letters. Jamie's name also includes the names of many of her relatives and words such as friend and love. Registering her name in Houston, Texas was not an easy task. <laughs> In fact, at the registrar's office, it took, oh my gosh, it took, <coughs> help us, Lord. It, it, oh, how many did it take? It took seven other birth certificates and the space provided to register a name. It was such a terrible process for the clerks in the office that they made new rules after registering Jamie's 1,023 letter name. They said, uh, only two typewritten lines in the 518 inch, inch space on the official birth certificate is all we will allow from now on. Jamie's mother explains that she chose this name because she wanted it to be unique. She succeeded and it is in the Guinness Book of Records as the world, world's longest name. Wow. If you want to talk about powerful names, though, or names that really matter, you know, God bless little Jamie with that name. But if you want to talk about a powerful name, most powerful name on the face of this earth, most unique name as well, turn to today's Bible text. Therefore God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus only five letters, not a thousand, but what a name. It's a name about which sermons are offered, lives have been transformed, 
People have fanned out to the corners of the earth. It's a name so powerful that bodies have been healed. Minds transformed and changed. Hospitals have been built. Schools have been established. People have been rescued. And sins have been forgiven. All of it in this name. Jesus. Amen. Say that name back. Jesus. Jesus. Say it again back. Jesus. Jesus. You can't share a name more powerful than the name of Jesus. But let me throw this out to you. It, it was a common name in the Lord's time. Like Tom, Bob, John are common now. And one time, great adventure, Glenn and I were there, and you know, uh, this like guy, this dragon or whatever, said, what's your name? I said, John. He said, that's different. <laughs> the historian Josephus, a historian in Jesus' time said, I, I know over 20 people named Jesus. So what sets this Jesus apart that makes his name the most powerful name on the face of this earth? The name Jesus, like most common Hebrew names, had a traditional theological original meaning. It means God saves. Yahweh saves. Matthew picks up on this in the gospel when the Lord's messenger indicates to Joseph, you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. What's so special about this Jesus? St. Paul gives us an answer in verses 6 and 7. Did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant. Jesus is the new Adam. He succeeds at the point the old Adam failed. Adam and Eve wanted to go higher. They wanted to be like God. Jesus wanted to be like us. He made a choice to go lower. As low as he could go in social status, there were two words for a servant, diakonia, that's where we get the word deacon from. The other word was doulos, which literally means slave. And Jesus chose that Identity freely chooses it. It's an act of divine grace and an expression of God's love. And in my study of this, this is who God's, this is who God is. This isn't like he's leaving a part of God. This is an act of love that God does, that Jesus does. It's an act of love becoming a slave and a servant on our behalf. He chooses to be in relationship with us. He dies on the cross for our sins. And this is the most God statement in the Bible of who God is. And God is love. And this is what my love means for you. How much do you love me, Jesus? He loves us this much. God loves us this much and spreads his arms to die for us. Okay? Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Now, 
even a better translation would be, let the same mind be among you that was in Christ Jesus. I don't care who you voted for. God doesn't care who your political party is. You know why? Because it's under Jesus. It is to be under the, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So Jesus is not only supposed to be in us, He is calling to be among us. What will this gracious calling look like? in our lives. What does it mean to bear the name of Jesus? Does our life together reflect the same mind that was in Christ Jesus? Are we looking to the interests of others rather than our own interest? What Jesus does is love. It's love and the statement is, this is who God is. You know, everything each of us has is a gift from God. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell, this is in my notes, Malcolm Gladwell wrote a nice book called Outliers. And this is my spin. There's no such thing as a self-made person or self-made man or woman. What, are you kidding me? Even even the times you are born in has a great effect on your success in life. You know, John D. Rockefeller in part became John D. Rockefeller because of when he was born. And, cause, and, and because of a little three-letter word called oil. <laughs> And you can just, you know, a product of society, a product of your family, whatever. Everything each of us has is a gift from God. We have been redeemed and restored. Here we go again. Have the same mind in you that was in Christ Jesus. What would you have me do, Jesus? That's a good question. There was a 1990s commercial, Be Like Mike. You know who that was? Mike who? Come on, chat it out. God bless you, Jim. <laughs> Michael Jordan. Be Like Mike. You had to do one thing. It was an advertisement. <coughs> who knows what that was? Drink. Right. Drink Gatorade. That's all you had to do. That's all I had to do. Drink Gatorade and I'll be playing basketball like Mike and George. <laughs> Give me a bottle, please. <laughs> Let the same mind be in you, among you, that was in Christ Jesus. To be like Jesus there's two emphases here. Humility and obedience. To be like Jesus. You want to be like Jesus? Humility and obedience. Humility. I grew up in the Episcopal Church. One time we had a, a bishop come very gracious man, good preacher. I don't remember what he said, but I remember how he said it. He was just, I mean, in the Episcopal Church, most preachers are laid back. Bishop Martin was. And one time I heard a Sunday school teacher just say, oh, he has the gift of gab. That's just the way he put it. So the next time Bishop Martin came, we're all suiting up the choir, I'm an acolyte, and I said to Bishop Martin, I said, Bishop Martin, I was uh, all the age of 10 about that, I said, Bishop Martin, you have the gift of gab. <laughs> the choir members, I thought,
don't think we're going to die. <laughs> Bishop Martin, I can still see it. He put out his hand, his right hand in fellowship. He said to me, thank you, young man, for that wonderful compliment. God bless you, Bishop Martin. May the souls of the faithful departed in Christ rest in peace and let perpetual shine upon them. The brightest and the best doctors I have ever met have been the humblest. Do you have any questions? The brightest and the best in really most any field I've come across have been the humblest. You know, one time, and I don't remember the exact circumstance, but a guy was uh, on the stand under oath, and he was asking, and, and who is the greatest, he played football, and who is the greatest player who ever played that position? And this guy was the humblest guy on the face of the earth. He said, that would be me. And his coach said, who agreed with him, said that guy. I couldn't believe you said that. And he said, I was under oath. <laughs> I had to say it. In other words, it's not false humility. It's real. God has given you a gift. He's given you a gift. My God. The humility of Christ is the highest virtue of being in community. I can still, in the old church, see Reverend William Reese, who is now with the Lord, telling us a story. It's a Catholic cardinal addressing the people. And he said, you know, sometime in Catholic school, you just, you just get like a rotten kid. And they're just so rotten, you just don't know what to do with them. So let me tell you about this one boy. The principal, the, 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 the principal of the school is so fed up. All he said to that kid, said, you go into the church. And in the Catholic church, Jesus is on the cross. It's good to remember that. He said, I, I've had enough of you. You just go into that church and you look at Jesus on the cross and said, what you've done for me on the cross, I don't give a rip about. Whatever, something like that. You died on the cross for my sins and I could care less. The Catholic Cardinal said, the kid went into the church, he knelt at the altar. And those words just could not come out of his mouth. And he said to the people, I was that boy. I was that kid. Humility. And then be obedient, a servant. What will that look like? Obedience. What will that look like? In my life, in your life, in our, in our life together, as a, as a church. What will that look like? Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. The expression of God's love in Jesus. In humility and in obedience. That's our Lord's trademark. That's what he wants us to be like. Help us, Lord. You know, I, I wrote this 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 quote down. It says, you know, when we follow Jesus, you know, Palm Sunday is about a fantastic, triumphant entry. And next Sunday, we celebrate a resurrection. It's the middle of the story that's hard. Amen. Amen. And sometimes in our journeys as well. Jesus our Lord, Jesus, is the greatest name. Help us, Jesus. 
May He change our lives to His glory. May He change our lives to His glory. Amen. Let's pray. What on earth is our calling, Lord? Please do not pass us by. Help us, Lord, to live in humility and obedience to you. You're the greatest name on the face of this earth, on earth and in heaven. Help us to follow you.